Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charlotte Audrett. I am Director of Public Services and Communities here at the RSA. I am delighted to welcome you here for this special event. Before we begin, can I ask you to turn off your mobile phones uh, to silence? We're filming today and live stream over the web. So hello to everyone who's joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag is hashtag RSA Cities if you'd like to join the discussion. We've got a fantastic panel here today to share their thoughts on the evolution of the city, the role of technology, and some uh, themes of uh, inclusive growth. Um, so it's, we're in for a real treat. Um, we've got Brimi Balaram, senior researcher at the RSA and an expert on the sharing and gig economies. We've got Chris Murray, director of the Core Cities Group, the 10 largest cities outside of London. We've got James McClure, um, uh, Airbnb's general manager for Northern Europe, and Alex Stephanie, a uh, successful peer-to-peer -peer entrepreneur, and we'll hear more about peer-to-peer -peer entrepreneurs later, and advisor to the Seoul Metropolitan Government on the sharing economy. For the last couple of years at the RSA, we've been uh, developing ideas on two important concepts, um, and we bring those here together for the first time. On the one hand, this evolving idea of the sharing in gig economies and the changing nature of technology, and the other, cities and inclusive growth. So the questions that we're going to be exploring today include, well, how, how can these technologies uh, enable cities to tackle some of the economic, social, political, environmental, these complex uh, challenges that our cities face? How can technologies serve to, to help tackle some of those? Could they prove to be the restorer of our democracy or the driver of fairer prosperity? Well, uh, we're going to find out. And first of all, uh, Brimi, so over to you, Brimi. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, so our starting point for this new project at the RSA on network cities was reflecting on the smart city trend that took hold over the last decade. While smart technology, such as automated traffic lights, uh, has been around since the early 1900s, the concept of the smart city as an urban strategy really seemed to take off with more recent developments in technology. The smart city, as most people understand it now, is a city that integrates information and communication technology and the Internet of Things to manage a city's assets. So, for example, in Barcelona, they implemented a sensor system for drivers that guides them to available parking spaces. These sensors, which are embedded into the ground, can sense whether or not a vehicle is parked in a given location, and by directing drivers to open spaces, these sensors have allegedly reduced congestion and emissions. Another example would be the use of intelligent streetlights in Glasgow. So they also use sensors, but to turn lights on and off at night, depending on footfall, in order to save energy. But there's a question here about whether or not there's a line in terms of using this sort of technology and the level of data that is being collected with it. And how do we know whether we've already crossed this line? So for example, in Singapore, they've deployed an undetermined number of sensors and cameras across the city state to allow government to monitor everything from the cleanliness of public spaces to the density of crowds. And these can also track the movement of every locally registered vehicle. In Rio, IBM has built a high-tech operation center which enables real-time tracking of conditions in the city by combining data from over 30 urban agencies and installing cameras across the city. So it was originally attend, intended to be a tool to predict rain and manage flood response, but it now has become a way to monitor and exercise control over people and events. In general, there's still a lot of talk about optimizing cities. And these sorts of examples have provoked critiques from the likes of scholars like Adam Greenfield about whether smart city advocates are simply trying to turn cities into computers and assuming that urban planning can be reduced to algorithms. Concerns have been raised about the level of surveillance and the lack of transparency about how data is being used. In recognition that the use of technology can be disempowering for citizens of smart cities, the RSA is proposing network cities as an alternative. So whereas citizens were once passive bystanders to, te to, to technology, in network cities, the use of peer-to-peer -peer technology means that citizens must actively consent and participate in its use. So examples of peer-to-peer -peer technology might include sharing platforms or crowdfunding uh, and, ci and citizen engagement tools such as Polis or Rizoku. And these peer-to-peer -peer platforms can empower people through connecting, connecting them to one another through a network. So smart cities, they were critiqued because big technology companies were driving down uh, or driving a top-down approach determined by the sort of technology they were producing. But what's exciting about peer-to-peer -peer technology is that the network is ultimately decentralized and de distributed. And the purpose of a network can be shaped, but there is a lot more scope for bottom-up and grassroots movements to emerge as well. 
And to a certain extent, we've seen that peer-to-peer -peer technology is already being embraced in sharing cities like Seoul, for example, which Alex might be able to speak more to. Uh, and the purpose of these sharing cities is to encourage and invest in shared re resources such as lending libraries, bike sharing schemes, and co-working spaces. But peer-to-peer -peer technology is not always required, and in some cases, it's just a conduit. It's seen as a way of helping to achieve a particular aim. So we envision that in network cities, peer-to-peer -peer technology would be embedded in systems akin to the technology of smart cities, but it would enable a collaborative approach to problem solving as it has in sharing cities. And in network cities, the goal that citizens uh, are working towards would actually be broader than managing shared assets and resources. The ambition here would actually be to apply peer-to-peer -peer te -peer technology to support inclusive growth. So while cities have long been drivers of growth, in recent years, they've also struggled with widening inequality, and this has compelled cities to pursue a new agenda that rebalances social objectives and economic priorities. Under the banner of inclusive growth, cities are grappling with problems spanning areas of health, housing, the environment, aging, and other demographic issues. So at the RSA, we'd argue that network cities actually goes beyond simply rethinking the smart city or sharing city in terms of the tools or technologies that we use or how we engage citizens because we're also redefining the problems and the challenges being tackled. The network city is about more than managing public space and population growth or enabling resource efficiency. Rather, it's taking into account wider social challenges that must be overcome um, as cities pursue a more equal society. So there may be some people here wondering if we really need yet another term to describe the future of the city, but I think it is helpful to create some distance from the smart city concept and to distinguish this clearly from what governments are trying to achieve with sharing, with, with sharing cities. So for us, this is about reconsidering the problem and creating solutions that reflect the importance of, imp of inclusive growth in cities. And to progress the concept of network cities, we want to first bring together peer-to-peer -to -peer technology platforms like Airbnb and Beam with inclusive growth stakeholders like Core Cities so that there is a shared understanding of what is possible with peer-to-peer -peer technology and the social challenges that cities have identified as priorities. So we want to encourage platforms and inclusive growth stakeholders to explore new ways of working together uh, towards common goals. And then the question becomes, how can we harness budding in existing networks for new purposes that support cities in achieving inclusive growth? Thanks. Uh, so Charlotte said what the core cities are, and I'll just talk about this from the <coughs> perspective of the, the membership, the group of cities I work with here in the UK, uh, and about why particularly inclusive growth is critical to the future of our cities, to their economies, to their societies and their stability. Um, also about how technology might help that, and I think this is largely about new tools for old persistent problems that we're, we're trying to solve in cities, um, particularly around living standards, which have been very low for a long time for far too many people in our cities. And, that's across successive governments, successive policies to try and deal with this. We, I think we do better than we have, but we certainly don't do well enough. And there's a sense in which that those low living standards are pushing back against the system now uh, and driving part of that anti-establishment feeling that I think we're experiencing across the whole of the West, actually, not just, uh, not just here in the UK. Um, Inequality is actually, according to a lot of surveys across the Western world, the greatest concern that people have. They rank it higher than climate change, they rank it higher than terrorism, because fundamentally, if you don't solve inequality, you don't address it, you can't address any of those uh, other issues. It's also a very big economic issue for cities in this country as we face particularly uh, Brexit, but actually even without that, it's an issue we need to do something about. Core cities, uh, biggest cities in the UK outside of London, have remarkably low levels of productivity when you compare them internationally. If you look at uh, cities in countries across Europe, North America, you would expect the top tier of cities to, for most of them to outperform the national economy. But here in the UK, it's only London and Bristol that do that. Our view, and this is supported by much of the evidence, is that is largely to do with the heavy levels of centralisation that we have in this country, where cities control virtually none of 
the taxes raised in them or indeed the way that a lot of uh, public money is spent compared to, to other countries. But it has, a, it has an impact on productivity as well. And if we compare the average of all the core cities productivity uh, to Munich, Munich is 88% higher per person in terms of productivity. Uh, Rotterdam is 42%, Barcelona 26%. So there's, there's a the real issue here that we need to address. It's not all about centralization. And when we look at, when we dig into the detail of those productivity issues, we see that just over 60% of our low productivity is to do with in-work issues. So it's about how business operates, the support business gets from transport, broadband investment, and things like that. But the other 38 or so percent is nothing to do with that at all. It's to do with deprivation. It's to do with the fact that people are not actually engaged with the labour market at all, that people have low levels of skills, low confidence and poor health and find it very difficult to engage uh, with job offers even if they were there. So that's a drag on productivity. It's a cost to public finances and it's not very pleasant actually if you're in that position as an individual or a family. That gap uh, between the average productivity of core cities and the UK average is about 60, minus 66 billion a year. And it's not, a, it's not a big gap actually, and we think it's very realistic for us to raise productivity in a way that delivers more inclusive growth by focusing on that 38% that are not part of our labour markets, our, labour markets and our economy at the moment. What do we do about that? It, it comes down fundamentally to taking the perspective of place on these issues. Now, what I mean by place is understanding the interdependencies of different markets, of sectors, of public services, of funding streams, uh, and, and infrastructure, and so on, within a specific geography, within a meaningful geography. And that, for us, is largely the functioning labour market, roughly the city region. And if you can understand the way that things work or don't with each other uh, in that geography, you've got a much better chance of aligning effort to achieve outcomes that that place uh, and those people need and that play to the distinct characteristics and needs of that place. Um, and a couple of examples of this. One is the, our skills system, which is very uh, supply driven. So a lot of the courses that are put on that have little to do with the needs of a local labour market or actually the jobs that are available. So, you know, people train and then don't uh, get jobs as a result of that and it doesn't help business. Um, and that's largely because national and local um, funding streams and agencies are not cooperating in the way that they should and indeed that they would like to do very often because of the way that they're tasked and funded. Another one would be housing where we have something like 36 different funding streams for housing which are not terribly well joined up and a, a national policy which is largely designed to fix the issues in the southeast uh, and not the rest of the country and housing is critical to uh, inclusive growth and I could go on there are other examples health and social care which is in the news today is another one so what we describe as public sector reform is a re-engineering of those systems looking at them through the lens of place how can we make sure that these things interact in a way which support and not undermine each other and the outcomes uh, that we need and, and actually we're making progress on that we're making very good progress under successive governments the devolution agenda which rsa have been instrumental in are a part of that but we need to go a lot further in policies like the forthcoming industrial strategy should that still be a policy should the conservatives uh, form the next government and and so on so finally how can technology help all of that well data actually underpins all of the policy areas and more uh, that i've just mentioned and it can be uh, uh, used as an enabler for specific public service interventions things like the the internet of things and it can free people from the sort of rigid institutional constraints uh, that they have with more bureaucratic systems so there's a very direct relationship between service uh, and user this is at its most positive i think we need to be aware of the limitations of technology though and not become too 
starry-eyed about what it might solve. And in the past, it has often ended up becoming um, the servant of the status quo. And I think if, if there's an opportunity here to move beyond that, then we should absolutely grasp it. And for me, that is also about the individual experience uh, of the city. And when we think about cities, I'm guilty, as guilty as this as anyone, we tend to take a kind of top-down view. It's a typical planner's approach to, the, you know, we look at a map of the city, we're looking down on it, at its systems and its grids. And perhaps the technology that is operating now could allow us to look up from beneath the city through a filter of emotion and experience as well as structure and uh, economy. And pro projects like the London Mood project, I think, are very interesting in this respect. This is an app that asks you several times a day just how you feel about where you are, and it, it creates a kind of mood map of, of the city and the work that, uh, the very good work that people like Space Syntax have done about the way we move around cities, which is quite instinctive and, and, and almost, you know, conforms to very ancient ways of behaving, but actually has economic, um, uh, economic impacts. So finally, I think, you know, uh, when we think about economy and we think about inclusive economy and inclusive growth, we, we imagine sometimes that economy is a kind of fixed objective sets of laws. And actually, there's a bit of that, but they're also based on a shared set of beliefs like trust in money and uh, a shared act of imagination like globalization. So they're not they're not really biological laws in, in the way that actually we uh, operate. And if there's one thing that we could do uh, with this new technology, I think that would be really transformational and re is to redefine the way that we think about growth and to harness it uh, behind a collective act of imagination toward a different set of goals that allow us to think more uh, about inclusive growth. Thank you. Um, but if we were sitting here in 2007 or 1997 or earlier, we might not have used the phrase inclusive growth, but I think a lot of the things that you bring up could well have been points of discussion in a similar session to this, and that technology doesn't necessarily become the solution to achieving, but it's an enabler to achieving inclusive growth. I'd like to give a few examples as to how that can come to pass from the experience that Airbnb has. If you think of the core business of Airbnb around people sharing space in their homes, that a result for London is that with three quarters of the listings in Airbnb being outside the main hotel areas, tourists and others will end up seeing a different bit of London. That's both hopefully good for the tourists, they get a greater understanding of what life can be like, promotes some inclusivity and cross-cultural pollination, but also means that a lot of the economic benefits that can come get distributed across the city. And then we see that the growth in people staying in the outer boroughs of London is a good 20 plus percentage points higher than the growth of that into, into inner London. And you can also enable some of the challenges in society to, again, be enabled where if you have a very passionate set of people and a community that giving them a platform to do good things, to be inclusive, you can actually get a lot of excellent results. So, um, Airbnb, we have a disaster relief tool, which means that in the time of a hurricane or a crisis or something, that our hosts can open up their homes for free. They get all the kind of all the service that we provide, but for free to help displaced people come in. That wasn't that wasn't Airbnb's grand idea to say, "Oh, we think this is a good idea. Let's do it." It actually came out of the community in 2012, Hurricane Sandy, when it hit the East Coast. Actually, just a lot of the a lot of the hosts decided to do this anyway and putting the, fee, the, the price to zero. And then we recognized and heard that and looked to make that something which we can deploy in areas. So again, that's not that technology necessarily comes up the solution, but it allows people to think about it and where people to engage to provide a great solution. Uh, closer to home, we're working in the um, Old Kent Road along with Space Hive on a, on a crowdfunding project to move a disused car park into a community space and that although Airbnb, the company, is able to provide some help on uh, funding and uh, best practice, but ultimately it's the host that we have in the community in that local area who are looking to 
donate their time, skills and expertise to help make that a successful project to help for the benefit of that, of that local area. And then on the bigger stage of, you know, the world of travel bans and uh, all the rest of it, that something it, it can feel quite a scary place for displaced persons, refugees, etc. that as part of our We Accept campaign, we're looking to provide uh, up to 100,000 people over five years a chance to stay in short-term short housing. And we're working with the International Rescue Committee to mean that there's the chances for refugees, people who've been displaced, to both have a place to stay, but also, more importantly, to find a community again, and to mean that there's that chance for cities to grow in an inclusive, inclusive fashion. So I think the, the sharing economy started in that idea of what someone has and what someone needs. And it can be as simple as the lawnmower or uh, the driveway for car parking or the spare room, but that if you start to broaden that out, that some of the technology and platforms that can help to underpin that can also help on the community side, so to connect a need for a city with the people who have the desire, skills, abilities to really contribute. And I think that's where you know, sustainable and inclusive growth with the assistance of, but not the solution from technology can really uh, be a, a real force for good. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to ask, uh, start with a quick question. How many people in the audience have heard of the computer game Civilization? Okay, <laughs> definitely more than averagely nerdy audience, I'm pleased to say. Um, so or maybe it's our age. Yeah, it's also our age. Um, there's been a whole series of them, so um, um, my parents would have uh, watched me as a, as a kid playing it. Um, and for the, uh, for the uninitiated in this computer game, what it involves is uh, you start as a settler, and the world is black and unknown. And um, you then uh, begin exploring and you develop technologies and you meet other tribes. And the end game is to completely dominate the world, whether that is by scientific research or war or whatever it is, um, and to come out on top. Um, and playing this computer game as, as, a, as a kid, I think taught me two things about cities that um, are pretty relevant to this sort of um, debate and will probably always be true. Um, the first is that they're really fricking old. Um, and we sometimes forget this because we live more currently in a sort of era of nation states. But you know, there are cities on this planet that are more than 10,000 years old. There are many cities that are more than 5,000 years old. There are probably hundreds that are more than 1,000 years old. Um, and then you think that actually you know, Italy, Germany, really only you know, unified in 1871. So you know, cities are really, really much older. Um, and we sometimes forget that the story of the city is is a very, very long story that will continue, I think, into, in, in, to, to, to the end of civilization. Obviously, that's where the term comes from. Um, and the second thing that it taught me about cities is they're first and foremost about efficiency. So shortly after you invent the city, which arises giving the opportunity to have granaries and to share information and to meet people and to progress at a much faster rate, you develop the marketplace. And the marketplace and the city have this very long symbiotic relationship. And what they share is the fact that they make sense. They create economic efficiencies. They create social efficiencies. And so, you know, that's what we used to do back in the day. We used to just build big market squares because that was a really smart thing to do. So if you were kind of the king of Poland, you would build Krakow and you would build the biggest square in Europe. So lots of people could go there with their cows and people could sell their goods and find the best price and it made sense. And then the internet comes along, and the internet kind of supercharges these fundamental things about cities, their scale, their efficiencies. Um, and suddenly, you have marketplaces that are kind of uncapped, effectively, just by the number of internet connections. Before, you had this massive marketplace, this physical square, and now it's like millions of times the size. Um, and so I see these as sort of fundamental attributes that will give cities growing influence in the world to the point where we could have actually what are almost like digital city-states. And just to look a little bit more closely at what these sort of efficiencies mean, two of the companies that I've been uh, closely involved with have really leveraged these efficiencies. So um, one of them, James mentioned, is called Just Park. Um, and what we did there is we really pioneered the use 
of um, driveways for parking. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer parking model. Previously, people thought, oh, you just park on the street, right, or you park in a car park. Actually, we said there's a whole lot of unused space and it's in front of people's homes and it's at churches and shops and whatever. Let's use that space. And that created an efficient market. And I'm also, also on the board of a company called SpaceHive, um, which is kind of crowdfunding for cities. Um, and again, this is an activity that it goes online and it suddenly becomes very, very efficient. So what you can do on that platform is as a local person, you have an idea about something that will improve your area. And then you kind of build a coalition. You collaborate with maybe local companies, maybe large companies, the local council, and you kind of get stuff done. Um, and then we, we see these kinds of efficiencies taking place in this kind of offline, online nexus all over the world. Um, uh, Brimi mentioned Seoul, and there you see both very large companies like Airbnb operating, um, truly global efficient marketplaces, and then you see also um, these very small scale, almost kind of social enterprise type, type businesses. Um, that are again predicated on the fact that we all live in this tight-knit world in this little mini in this in the city and we can do things that we need to do things that make sense so that might mean very pragmatic things like sharing a bicycle it might mean uh, sharing a toy uh, with your neighbors so there's these kind of very cute rooms full of toys and parents don't need to buy toys they just go and rent them um, when I was there about a year ago um, there is this um, brilliantly run efficient facility where people um, having job interviews would go and borrow a suit and they would get a whole suit, a tie, the whole works and it would cost them a tiny amount of money. And typically these were for sort of blue collar roles where people might not need to have one or more suits. They were able to access that asset at a tiny, tiny cost just by kind of walking across the town. Um, so I think the city is in good shape and I think that really the future is one that um, someone like Benjamin Barber has outlined where actually these cities, because of their fundamental strengths in this networked world, are able to, to grow in prominence. Um, and I think that if we have um, you know, very elegant devolution where um, people in cities and people running cities get to actually make more decisions that impact the cities and their citizens, um, and also we have um, the emergence of sort of global citizens, people who have a shared pool of experience because they're traveling frequently, they're connected and doing business with many people all over the world. Um, I like to think that the future is probably not the nuclear Armageddon that I may have seen as a kid playing Civilization, but actually a um, very bright, productive, um, prosperous and secure one. Thank you. Fantastic contributions, thank you. Um, I'm just going to reflect very briefly on the work that I've been doing on inclusive growth in cities, and I think it really aligns to what we've heard from the four panellists. Um, I speak about inclusive growth meaning to having two dimensions to it. The first, speaking to the kind of hard economic, typically, indicators around inequality, levels of relative or absolute deprivation, productivity, and Chris touched on that in his talking about cities in terms of planning and grid systems and structures and institutions. But there's this other, more intangible part of inclusive growth in cities. And again, Chris mentioned some of that kind of more emotional or experiential. And I talk about belonging, identity, and connectedness. And I think the latter has shown itself just as powerful as the former. And I think it's the driving force behind the kind of politics of the left behind. The question, you know, who's the economy for? Is it, is it for me? Am I a part of that? Do I feel like I have benefited from, you know, the, the fact that, say, the UK has been the fastest growing economy in the G7? Well, that's all right. Thanks very much if you're uh, in our renewed financial institutions that seem to be back on their feet. But not if you're, um, you know, living in place X in a you know, post-industrial town in the north of England. Um, so this politics of the left behind um, is, I think, the driver behind um, much of the um, uh, restructuring and the shakeout that we're seeing in Western politics. And I think the questions that I've got for the panelists then um, build from that. So, Alex, you talked about a digital city-state. And my question to you is kind of who's in this 
digital city state? And is there a risk that people will feel that they are just as left behind in this new world as they have felt in, in our current one? The second point speaks to the kind of nature of uh, devolution and the fact that cities are increasingly happily seeing that they're being given more unrestricted or not thoroughly investment funds to figure out how they themselves can be more um, uh, thriving, fairer um, places. So my, my question, um, particularly to Chris, is how can places invest in the types of technologies that you're talking about? Or is it that, perhaps to James and Brimmy, that it's something that is kind of infrastructure that has to evolve. It's, it's a part of an organic digital system and we, you know, we have no real con control of it. Is that legitimate though? Is there a role of government in shaping that and not just it coming from the tech world? And then finally, and one of the things that I thought was fascinating about Airbnb's creating what seems to be a network of local hosts that people are shaping and forming communities that we might not have anticipated before. And I certainly had never have thought that if I were to become a, an Airbnb host that I'd be part of something else and I would feel a connection and identity with another host because we were, we were sharing a platform. So um, three questions there. Who, who are people left behind in this new digital city state? How do we invest in it if we think it's a good thing? And um, what's this sort of the na changing nature of community that you see as a result? So I hope those questions uh, sound sensible to start the debate. And maybe we start at Brimmy and work the way down. Sure. So on your question about, you know, is this stuff organic or do, do cities actually play a part in, in shaping this? And I think that part of what we're trying to do here is actually to bring these two different parties together. So peer-to-peer -to -peer technology platforms, and that could be sharing economy platforms like Airbnb, or it could be crowdfunding platforms like SpaceHive, and we're introducing them to city, to inclusive growth stakeholders so that one, they understand the, the challenges that cities are facing and they think about their own networks and how they might, uh, how their networks might, for example, help address those challenges. And I think that crowdfunding has actually provided a really good model or example of what can be achieved. Uh, so SpaceHive, Space Hive uh, has a partnership with the GLA and they're trying to roll out different initiatives in terms of how can you uh, how can you start funding community initiatives in different cities that people actually care about and how can you do that involving the people that, that live in those places and I think that you could probably do that for other peer-to-peer -peer technology uh, using other peer-to-peer -peer technology platforms as well. I just really, really like a lot of the points that, that, that were made about uh, particularly about cities being being old and being here for the long run, and that certainly, I think, is when you look at the messages that come from cities about what import, what's important, that's absolutely the case. There's another, there's another sense in which, the, if we think about the sort of whole of human history, they're quite new. You know, so if you imagine we've been around for about 200,000 years as modern humans, 10,000 years is quite a, a short time, and cities were very small to begin with. In a few years' time, we know 70% of the planet will live in one. So there's something about cities that is really important to us uh, as, as, as a species and the future of our species is absolutely linked to them. And it, and it sort of strikes me sometimes that at that moment where, that, we're, that we're just talking about, there's a sort of Faustian pact made with cities and we accepted the good as well as the bad uh, at, at that point in time. And actually we've arrived at a point where we need to really reconsider that and do something about it. And there, there are two components to that that I think were really important. The first, which continue to be the case for cities, the first is that cities shrink the world. So even in ancient Mesopotamia, you know, the uh, sort of life of hunter-gatherers and uh, farming was shrunk and became the grain store and the market and ritual landscapes became temples and, you know, centers of governance and so on. So it shrinks the world around you, it makes it manageable, you can stay in one place. Then they accelerate all of that through uh, uh, increased human contact. And it just struck, struck me that actually the technology we're talking about does both of those things too. It shrinks the world and it accelerates contact. So it goes very much with the grain of what cities are really about. So, and the question then is of course, well how do we, how do we, um, deal with that other element of this pact that we're not terribly uh, happy about. 
and we've talked about some, some sort of strategic solutions. Your specific question, Charlotte, was about um, how we pay for it, how we, how we invest in it. And there are a number of ways of doing that. But I think there's, there's something about the public and private sector coming together and trying to solve a shared problem through innovative procurement methods that I think could really move us forwards here without having to put more money into the pot. So if we as a group of cities, set, you know, 10 bigger cities, maybe London as well, that's 50% of the economy and the population got together and said, look, we've got this big problem. Can we work with you to try and come up with some technical solutions that will solve that? And if you come up with the goods, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you for it. So I think it's that kind of thinking uh, that we need to, to take this forward. And you're thinking on the, like the haves and have nots or the left behind bits, I think that actually it's a lot about the mindset and style. So if I was to paint a, um, a generalised picture, you may imagine that Airbnb's hosts would, be, would all look a bit like me. You know, uh, nice glasses, shirt, some sort of age which is not clearly very old. Um, but that... But that Actually, for, depending on where you are in the country, about 15 to 20% of our hosts are people over 65. It's the fastest growing bit of our host segments. And actually, they get the best reviews on, um, on average. And, and this is both something where, you know, like if I think of my parents, they've got more space in their house now, like no kids there. But also, and uh, I would hope that my parents aren't lonely, but that actually having someone there that my dad can... Tell, to, tell, what, tell him what's good in the local area, or that you know, there could be a little bit of fuss about making a cup of tea. That actually, I know this is a very trivial example, but it actually helps to reduce some of the challenges that you can see of loneliness in cities. And if you were to have 10 people lined up to try and guess who was an Airbnb host or not, it wouldn't be based on age or uh, gender or ethnicity or anything. It would be more on, if you ask them a bunch of questions, it's around, like, some of it's about openness and interest in other areas. Now, I don't necessarily have a solution for the haves and have-nots in openness versus closeness, but the, I think you can have a way which is the, what your stereotypes of what you think technology, who it's for and what it can be, doesn't need to hold true if there's an actual benefit and that there's a way to make it fairly straightforward and understandable. And I think on the bit of where governments can play a role, I don't think it necessarily is a it just organically all happens and it's all, all amazing. I think helping people to understand what, what, being clear on what regulations are and whether it's kickstarting on some areas or just giving some clarity. You know, so for London, um, before 2015, it was technically legal to have someone stay in an Airbnb in your house, but the law has changed in that there's, people are free to share the home for up to 90 days. Like an idea that this is something that that's a decent amount of time for someone to share their space. You could be away on holiday or going away for work for, for a little bit. So I think that the government role is often on setting some of the parameters as to how this should look to go, and then that allows a lot of the kind of the creativity to come. And just to push you on this uh, local host community <laughs> aspect, are you, are you, can you tell me more about that? Are you seeing this kind of pop up so that you know, people off the old Kent Road actually know who, where other hosts are or something or feel some connection? How does that work? And it more comes through initial sort of meetups that we have. So, like, actually, last night we did something in the Borough of Westminster, like a home-sharing club. And, again, this is more of a place where rather than you think, because I'm a, such a fan of Airbnb, the company, I'm going to turn up, it's more of an indication of the values that you have and that the interest that you may have, which means that you may well find like-minded people in that group and there's any there's like a host, a host group that i know that since going to a couple of meetups there's like five of them uh five ladies in like their i won't guess their age but um <laughs> somewhere but they, they they go out to the cinema or theater about once a month together and again it's not that they go wearing an airbnb badge or anything it's just that it's a way that they found people that they actually quite like and have similar like values and beliefs in and so that's actually what community is it's like having a a community football team like it's people gravitate towards things that they're interested in and have a like-minded things and if there's a way that you can help people to gravitate towards what they're interested in or what has a benefit for them then that can only be a good thing so you asked about inequality in cities and um yeah i suppose i should pick up on where i left off which was this quite 
semi-jokingly very rosy view of a future where the majority of the world are living in cities. Well, the majority already are, but 70-80% um, potentially within some of our lifetimes. Um, and um, actually, you know, I would say that that rosy world is not something that will come easily by any stretch. It will be very, very hard fought. It's possible, but if we get there, it will be very, very hard fought. Um, and one of the reasons we've seen a lot of global instability over the last um, few years in particular is because we've had, you know, with globalization, especially in the West, we've had this like huge delta in terms of the, um, the benefits of kind of having capital versus having labor. So the returns to labor have been really bad in the West. If you're basically a worker, you've been doing you know, pretty badly through globalization. But if you've had money and you've been able to invest in companies and um, get some of that cash back in dividends and, and see appreciation on property and all the rest, you've done pretty well. So that's kind of where we are today in the world. We have returns to capital and returns to labor and it's created a lot of political instability. Um, now we need to bring these things a little bit back together if we're gonna have a stable and prosperous city, uh, future in cities. And, and so you ask, does government or regulators have a role to play? Like a massive role is, is my view. Um, because if government does not play a massive role in that transition, there will be literally blood in the streets. That's something we will hopefully avoid. Um, because there's gonna be huge cataclysmic changes um, to the way that people live and work in the coming few decades. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is probably the most spoken about, um, but there's a whole series of other technologies um, from you know, autonomous vehicles, which is sort of using artificial intelligence, but it's a kind of quite separate category of development, really, um, to the blockchain. Um, and actually, there aren't going to be a whole bunch of jobs that now currently exist. So what's going to happen is going to need to be things like, I think, universal basic income. Um, and we'll have to find a way for um, people to actually find new things to do with their life. Um, it might not be work as we know it. It might be something completely differently. It's completely different. Um, and then I think the, the other thing I'd just like to add to that is this sort of notion of city problems versus country problems. I think there's no such thing in some sense because a city problem is just a problem that would be much, much worse if it was in the countryside, okay? The fact that it exists in a city, so things like hunger or um, clean water, makes a problem vaguely manageable. If this was a problem that existed because of proximity and efficiency, the ability to centralize um, the solutions to these things and, and um, if you actually had those, that same number of people trying to gain access to that same resource of that same quality in the countryside, it would, it would be a mess. And this is why you have urbanization. You know, I remember I was in China about 12 years ago and in some quite rural areas. And like, this is brutal, poverty-ridden areas. This you know, wasn't like a constable painting. This was pretty horrible. Um, and that's why these people were pouring into cities, because they were able to sustain a better life for themselves there. Well, we've covered a lot of ground already, and that's before we've opened up to your questions. So I'm going to come to you next. Please say where you're from and give me a wave, and the roving mic will be with you shortly. So I'll take this gentleman here. Then this gentleman here. Sorry, just the, with the mic. Yep, yep, go ahead. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Rob Shaw from Third Revolution. I'm a fellow as well. Um, I wanted to pick up on the comments uh, Chris was making about productivity and the gap uh, between the, the core cities and others and, and, and places like London, uh, and ask how important you think the industrial strategy that you, met, you mentioned is to solving some of those, those challenges. And as a supplementary then, assuming that, that we're going to end up with a, a conservative government in June, how committed is that government, that the party to, uh, to that industrial strategy. Okay, I'll take a few more. This gentleman here. Yeah. Oh, thanks, David Wilcox. Um, I'm a fellow as well. I mentioned that because, uh, as you may know, a group of London fellows are developing Network City London. I don't think we actually knew about each other until quite uh, recently. Um, uh, and there's been quite a lot of talk about um, communities and citizens and so forth. And I wondered if you could explicitly add a kind of third leg to your stool um, of smart cities, sharing cities, to make it participative cities um, as well. Because what struck me is we've been working very closely with community and voluntary organizations across London. And the sort of things we're talking about here 
are just completely foreign to most people. That's not just a question of digital inclusion and basic digital skills. It's the mental models and the ways of thinking about things and so forth are just totally different. And I think unless there is an explicit strategy to design bottom-up as well as top-down, tech-driven, concept-driven and so forth, it won't work. Sorry, and that gentleman over there. Hello. <clears throat> David Bent, I'm an Associate Fellow at the Centre for Science and Policy in Cambridge. I guess my question is about the role, so we talked about technology and the digital technologies in particular. So I like the idea of cities as an ancient technology that we're now augmenting with digital technologies. One of the features of the network effect of those technologies is the returns to scale. So as you get bigger, each new unit is easy to add and you keep on going. And that tends to end up with near monopolies and a greater concentration of power. So in the context of asking about inequality and people feeling left behind, what's the role, how do we, how do we deal with that sort of inbuilt feature of these platform technologies when we're also wanting to provide a greater distribution of power and a different sort of return to labor? Excellent, so three questions there. What role are the industrial strategies? How can we design um, these uh, interventions in a more bottom-up way and um, a tension between um, whether uh, platform technologies inherently concentrate power rather than uh, distribute it. Um, should we start this end and work this way? Sure. Um, well, I'll start with the final question, if I may. So the, the gentleman's absolutely right. So these marketplaces um, uh, exhibit what you'd call network effects. So each new unit into the marketplace makes it more powerful um, and then you um, couple in the phenomenon that some of these companies are started in areas where there's a very high concentration of capital um, that can kind of accelerate this. So you do have businesses like Uber and Airbnb um, becoming very, very large. Um, not necessarily glo entirely global companies uh, or globally you know, dominant companies um, and you know, what we've seen with um, Uber is actually it kind of got a bit of a kicking um, in India and China and beat a kind of slightly dignified retreat from those markets. So, you know, you don't necessarily have kind of Coca-Colas of verticals. Um, those are actually, you know, very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, and again, there's no reason why you wouldn't have, you know, strong sort of national um, marketplaces as well. Um, so I was going to caveat it with that. Um, you know, I, I do think it's a it's a, real, it's a real challenge, and again, this comes down to you know, governments and regulators making sure that the companies, um, if they are truly global, that profit from customers in certain markets, um, do their fair share to actually keep some of those financial benefits within that domestic market. Um, and so, you know, whether that means um, taxing them appropriately or regulating them appropriately so there's a level playing field for competition, um, uh, making you know certain numbers of, of hires in those markets, um, I think that's going to be a back and forth because if without governments, without regulators to hold some of those companies um, somewhat to account, um, then you do have a very very skewed and perhaps overly centralised economy. Can you want me on the first question again? From the yeah. So, what role of the industrial strategy is in closing these gaps between our cities? Yes, I think for the I think one of the things that it would be interesting to see in the industrial strategy is how the move of like mobile technology is able to get out to not just cities but elsewhere i mean like i uh, don't know why i'm talking about my parents the whole time but i grew up like just outside of just outside of london uh, like in stevenage and i used to work in bangladesh i get a better foot better signal in, in rural bangladesh than i do in my parents house in in stevenage and um, so i think that as an industrial strategy then that underpinning some of that with the ability to remove some of the barriers to there being the digital have-nots, I think is really important. And that kind of infrastructural one is often one where, although you know, the private sector will largely be able to the people who develop it with the building the base stations, but that continuing that idea of the you know, last mile broadband, et cetera, is gonna be really important to allow the benefits to not create like a, a left behind aspect. So I feel that that's a really important bit that, that I think most people would like to see from an industrial strategy is moving along there. I think on the on the platforms bit, and you know, obviously there's a natural bias from the answer that I'm about to about to give. I think that there's the barriers to entry are you know there's new platforms are 
coming up. It's not like it's been the same thing that's been sewn up in terms of business for, for ages and that the, the value transfer is, it is being the marketplace. So you know, if you think of if you put your house up on Airbnb for £100, like you have 97 of those pounds, that these are some of the bits which mean that it's staying in a local market as well as actually the people who are coming to visit are going to disproportionately spend in your area. So that the marketplace is really just a place for people to come and visit. There will be competing marketplaces in different areas, but that the real value transfer is for the participants in the marketplace rather than the marketplace owner. And a cheeky question, if I may. Mm. Are renters al al allowed to uh, put their houses on Airbnb? And is renters that of the... Renters of homes. Increasingly, home ownership is decreasing. Oh, sure. Well, yes, so, I mean, that's to be discussed with your landlord, but many, like, I've had a discussion with my landlord of, are you okay for me to be doing this? And it's, and we've got the clause set up in the contract, so, yeah. Great. Um, Chris. <laughs> Good. You, you're looking to actually uh, for a rental yeah, opportunity. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah. So. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, I think the, the, just to sort of take a slightly different angle on the, the, I think the second David's point about centralisation, if, if technology ends up <clears throat> um, reinforcing centralisation, then I think we've, we've gone astray, and that would be about supporting the status quo rather than being disruptive. And when we think about what's happened with cities, you know, 20 years ago, uh, a digital revolution began and people start to think that that was it for cities, that people would just go and move to villages and log on and all the rest of it and actually the opposite has happened for a number of reasons, that need for face-to-face -face interactions but also perhaps because the more technology we have, the more change we have to experience, the more fluidity comes into our, our lives in some respects and perhaps to counterbalance that we need a sense of anchorage and place becomes really important too in, uh, in a digital world. Um, if we're going to go with a grain of that and with cities, then actually it becomes a governance question and governance can be really dull, but it solves a lot of these issues. And governance for cities, governance for city regions in this country is it's beginning to take off, but it's still relatively weak compared to uh, a lot of other countries. On uh, Rob's question about uh, industrial strategy, absolutely. I mean, I think you sort of answered the question yourself in a sense. Um, the, we're, we're arguing very strongly that the industrial strategy should have this place-based uh, component within it, that it should focus on inclusive growth and not just growth, and that the latter has not uh, delivered um, in, in the past. I absolutely take the points about infrastructure and, and technology and so on. We've got to get that right. And when we look at what's happening in other countries like South Korea, you know, we're, we're way, way behind. But I think the primary focus for it, for me, should be about human capital. And we've significantly and persistently underinvested in that in this country. And as a great book out recently, I'll give him a plug, a colleague of mine, Mike Emmerich, on, on why things went wrong during the industrial revolution for the UK cities and essentially it was about underinvestment in human capital so we just got overtaken We're kind of at that moment again and, and if we don't understand that and we don't correct that imbalance then you know, I think the history will repeat itself. Uh, so I think the second question on bottom-up approaches and the third question on network effects and monopoly power is actually related so I think that we need to be mindful of distinguishing between different platforms. I think that you know, the way that we deal with commercial platforms, for example, might be different than the way that we deal with uh, platforms that are explicitly set up to address social challenges. So for example, I'm thinking of BuddyHub, which is a peer-to-peer -peer technology platform that connects uh, elderly people with people in their community that can help them address issues of loneliness and social isolation, or I'm thinking of um, Can We Go, which is a fellow-led platform um, that's being piloted, and that's about crowdsourcing information so that people know where the most uh, accessible places are in the city in terms of addressing issues of disability. So, for example, if you were going to a restaurant and you want a, a restaurant that was wheelchair accessible, um, I think those, those sorts of platforms, like, it's really great, actually, if they scale. And I think that, Actually, likewise, with some of these commercial platforms, we're realizing that they do have secondary benefits in terms of things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Like, for example, James is talking also about the fact that um, even though Airbnb is primarily about home sharing, we're starting to realize that there are other 
broader social benefits that are being realized. So uh, these hosts over 65 and, and the fact that that also address, addresses so, so social isolation. So I think taking, um, we need to kind of take stock of all of these different benefits that are possible before we, we were able to, to sort of manage our relationship with these platforms and decide how, that they sh how they should be regulated. But I also think that ultimately these networks are distributed and they are decentralized. And so there's a lot more scope for bottom-up approaches uh, and grassroots movements to emerge. And that's what's really exciting about them. Great, well I think, unless there's any other final comments or questions from the floor or the panel, just get, so I can get an engage. Okay, one question over there and then we might wrap up. Um, hi there, my name's Samit, I'm just an individual. Um, You're welcome to um, so we, you talked a lot about inclusive growth and we're talking a lot about cities, but I think one of the challenges with inequality that we see in this country um, is really the difference between cities and those that don't live in cities and the attitudes and the inequality that exists and the difference between that. And if we're looking to build an inclusive growth as much as cities are going to grow, we want to, that inclusive growth, in my opinion, needs to be something that we encourage people along with as opposed to people having to be drawn to cities because, because of the inequality that exists in their current situation. So how do we look at building inclusive growth that ensures that cities grow, but those that aren't in cities are, are brought along on that journey? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a really good point. I th the solution is, is complicated. Uh, I don't think the solution is to put exactly the same infrastructure into rural areas as cities, because then, you know, actually people are just going to build on rural areas and, you know, have uh, a, a lot of dialogue with the rural lobby about that. Um, the, the issue, I think, is probably more about outlying towns around cities. Uh, and you can look at a very distinct economic pattern in most of the UK and, and other city regions where the outlying um, urban areas uh, are, are not experiencing inclusive economic growth. And that I think is largely about having, they're not part of a strategy for the whole place. And we've played places off against each other to do with administrative boundaries, the way we work and so on. City regions are not the whole solution to that, but you can begin then at least to take a strategic view of what will work for the place as a whole in terms of the infrastructure that's required, the investment in skills, as I've said, and so on. So I think that's part of the answer, but it, it, it's quite complicated, but you're absolutely right to raise it. I would just say very quickly that the recognition of difference is very important as well. I mean, we talk a lot about devolution to urban centres, but actually uh, I think it's important that people who are traditionally seen as elites and guardians of power in cities actually say, you know, your values are different and they are no worse or no better than ours. Actually, you have the right um, to self-determine. And I think that um, in a world in which technology is more and more um, ubiquitous and um, all of what we do far more transparent and leaving a digital trail, I think there is this opportunity to actually cede power um, more and more to the regions too and the, and the countryside. Thank you all. Sadly, we've run out of time. I think it's been a fascinating, eye-opening discussion. I think the themes of inclusive growth and the changing nature of technology and peer-to-peer -peer platform technology in particular, they are go not going to be going away far from it. Um, so I think the question remains how we bring them to the two together. Just a few things that have struck with me. I think the gentleman who put it, sort of cities being an ancient technology and now we're augmenting it with new technologies. I think that's something that I'll really take away um, from today. And the other thing is that um, broadband is better in Bangladesh. So <laughs> who knew it? Thank you very much.